live on location here at Cody Manufacturing in Golden, Colorado. Um, we're here to talk about dissolved oxygen. And uh, it's a big topic because um, with COVID-19 and the shift toward packaging in cans, uh, people are trying to access more of the at-home drinking market and uh, they're trying to increase their, their market access. And so we've been engaged with a lot of clients on this topic and uh, often they want to know, you know, what kind of DO performance can we expect from your filler or, you know, how's that going to impact my quality? And so we wanted to talk about that because it's a complex topic and it's not just about the filler. It's not just about any one. There's actually a, a complex equation that goes into dissolved oxygen and, and, and TPO as well. So uh, joining me today is my friend and colleague, Andrew Ferguson from Cody. Uh, Andrew has always been my go-to craft canning guy, uh, you know, a true expert in the industry. He has a vast uh, array of experience ranging from distribution with Miller. Uh, he managed and, uh, and brewed at a small local craft brewery here in Colorado. Uh, he's worked for Wild Goose and now uh, Cody. And uh, Andrew, I'll just, you know, maybe uh, turn it over to you and we'll ask a, a few questions. Sounds uh, great. As we go. So um, talk to me about Dio. What is Dio? So DO stands for dissolved oxygen. And what it is, is it is oxygen that is getting into your beer before it is completely sealed in the can. And there's a difference between dissolved oxygen, DO pickup, and TPO. Dissolved oxygen is the quantity that is going into the can. DO pickup is at every location throughout the process, what quantity of DO is going into the can. And then TPO is your final measurement that you take right after the can leaves the seamer with a piercing device. And that gives you the total parts of oxygen that are in the final package that you're going to bring out to your customer. Awesome. Um, so brewers often focus on DO in tank. Uh, what can they do to get low DO from tank to fill it? Yeah. So uh, the majority of brewers that are hypersensitive about DO and ask us the questions about them, usually can achieve very low DO numbers in their tank themselves. But from that start of the process, all the way through the cans are seen through the seamer, we're gonna to try to talk through all of those parts. So one of the first things is actually getting the product from the tank and into the filler itself. Smooth connections, single hose is the best way to do it. If you have multiple hoses, more connection points, more nucleation sites, more backup, turbulent flow, more gaskets, those are all points that potential pickup could happen. And as the product is flowing into the tank, it's going to go through a, a variety of different components through our machine on its way to the fill head. In all these different components, there are tri-clamp fittings, there are gaskets, there are things that you want to write into your SOP to make sure that you are monitoring them, that you are inspecting those gaskets, that you're replacing them as needed. It's ideal to have the tank as close as possible to the filling machines, the shortest distance of travel, so you don't have temperature pickups and CO2 uh, volume changes. And to inspect everything along the way and make sure you have a smooth pass, similar elevation gain. And yeah, then you should be able to get great results from your tank all the way up until the fill head. So it sounds like it's a lot about procedure and it's about, you know, just the dedication to quality. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, great. Um, let's talk about cans, because I know a lot of people wouldn't think of cans as, you know, a place they need to be concerned about DO, but those cans sitting on a pallet, that's where we start, so. Yeah, so empty cans has a lot to do with dissolved oxygen, which is a misnomer for a lot of people. One of the biggest things is that you really need to respect the can all the way from when it's delivered to your facility until it enters into the filler portion itself. What I mean by respecting the cans is, if a can drops just from a pretty short distance and hits concrete, it can just get a little bit of dent here on the lip. Or if you have a lid stack on the ground and you drop a heavy piece of equipment on that, it's gonna bend your lip, the lids as well. Any slight variation in the lid of your can or in the can itself is never gonna create good seam integrity. So if you follow every best example throughout your brew house, into tanks, into the filler, but you don't have good seam integrity, then oxygen will continually be getting back into the can. So taking care of your cans is one of the best ways that you could ensure that you are providing the best capabilities for any filler. And that includes twist rinses. So how you get from the twist rinse 
uh, from the top height of a depalletizer into a filler, there's a very specific angle that you want to travel down. If it's too narrow of an angle, too uh, shallow, then the cans aren't gonna have enough back pressure to push into the can. If it's too upright, then what happens is when you spray the can with water, sandy, or ionized air, and it attempts to flip itself back up, in this little ridge right here, a lot of that water can get stored in there. The problem with water getting stored in there is that water has a lot of oxygen in it. And any of that residual water in there is gonna give you an obvious pickup of dissolved oxygen. We've seen it about three to five PPD at that single location. If money is not a concern, one of the best solutions you could have is ionized air. Ionized air will blow out all of the particular matter. It'll neutralize the charge of the can. So there's a negative or positive uh, charge that is holding particulate matter on the inside. When we neutralize that charge and we blow it out, everything's gonna exit out and you have a dry can entering into the filling machine. And dry means no water, which means no oxygen at that pickup location. Awesome, awesome. Um, so now that we're entering the filler, let's talk a little bit about foam, right? Because that's an important equation, part of the equation as we're filling cans. So how does foam play a role in uh, dissolved oxygen? Yeah, so foam is your friend in a lot of ways. You have your liquid fills up to your fill levels, and then you have a nice foam cap on top. And what foam is doing is that is the CO2 releasing out of suspension in the liquid, and it's pushing out oxygen from the top of the container. So having foam is a very good thing. What we're looking for is really closed cell foam. The smallest bubbles, the better. Big bubbles are rich with oxygen, but luckily we have some tips and tricks to help you out with that. Awesome. Um, what are some of the features of a filling machine that can help mitigate BO? Yep. So as we talked about the twist prints and bringing a can in, so now we're entering the can into a filling system. And the first step of the process that we have as one of our add-ons is a CO2 pre-purge. And what this does is this is going to go up and down with the fill heads themselves. They're going to pre-purge CO2 into the can prior to the fill location. And CO2 is a heavy gas. So if you put CO2 into an open container, it'll push out some of the oxygen and displace it with CO2. So if you see one of these on a filler, what you're doing is you're getting a blended gas of both CO2 and oxygen prior to the filling location. Now, as we go into the filler itself, this is a counter pressure uh, filling machine. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna seal the top of the can. It's going to vacuum out that remaining oxygen, displace it with CO2, so now you have a fully enriched CO2 environment. It's gonna fill with your product, get the product level to the official, the correct fill volume. And then it's under pressure at that point. So what we have to do is we have to release that pressure and you can't release it quickly. Think about if someone throws you a, a cold beer at a campfire and you catch it and you know it's gonna explode with a lot of CO2. One of the tricks that you can do is just slowly release the tab so you hear that and that release of pressure and then you fully open it. If you were to just fully open it, you'll have a lot of cascading foam come out all the time. So one of the things that we're able to do is we have multiple sniffs and the first sniff is gonna release a little bit of pressure and that second sniff is going to equalize the pressure to the, the ambient pressure in the room. So multiple sniff control is one of the things that is really good on counter pressure filling machines. One of the things that's unique about inline filling machines is that large rotary counter pressures do the same thing. And what they're doing is if you see all those valves on the side that are mechanically pushed through different portions of the circle, what it's doing is that's starting the fill, stopping the fill, uh, releasing the sniff and opening up the pressure, but they're at very specific set points. One of the advantages of having it in line is that we can control all of those sniff points. So it's not based on a location, it's based on your product conditions themselves. And so that we can create really good foam integrity, the correct type of foam and get it right to that location. The other thing that we've noticed is that if you watch a lot of filling machines on YouTube and you see them in person, is that when the fill heads retract and those cans start to move forward, there's often residual product at the top of the fill heads that then is dripping back 
into the empty cans themselves. And that's a challenge because that's often large cell foam, those frog eye bubbles, and it's super rich with dissolved oxygen. So one of the things that we're de we've developed is a little tray that as the fill head goes up, a tray will come out underneath the fill head, catch all of that drip and pour it away from the following cans. And then this tray will get pushed back and the filling portion will engage again. So all of that super enriched uh, bubbles are not going to drop back into the filler or back into the empty cans before the fill cycle starts again. Now we have a can it's filled with liquid. It's got a nice mushroom cap of foam on it. The foam is building up and pushing that oxygen out. And we need to travel from the fill location and into the seamer. One of the most common questions that we get is, why don't you put your seamer right next to your fill head? And one of the reasons that everyone isn't having that close proximity is because you need that foam cap to develop. It's aggressively bubbling out and then it'll stabilize and then you go into the seamer. If you try to drop a lid on a foam cap that's aggressively coming out, the lid will become really squirrely, it'll try to run away. And if the lid is just slightly misaligned and you go into the seamer, the seamer's not gonna be able to create good structural integrity around that seam. You're gonna have four seams and ruin all the hard work that you've already done. So one of the things that we're working on is a CO2 enriched tunnel right here so that the cans will travel underneath an environment with a very low volume flow of CO2. What this is doing is it's keeping the environment right around the top of the can and that foam surrounded with CO2. Obviously it's a low flow because we don't want CO2 escaping to the atmosphere and become harmful for any of the users. And then as directly before it goes into the lid dropper, we're going to burst another little jet of CO2 right on top of the can right before the lid is applied. It's really important at this location to not have a pinpoint injection of CO2, because if you spray uh, anything pinpoint, whether it's water or CO2, into the foam cap, it'll create a wake, it'll push all the foam out of the way, that'll create a void, oxygen will get back into that void. So a really evenly dispensed amount of CO2 is what we would consider best practice. And you also want to be very conscious of how the liquid travels from this location to this location. And you want to make it as smooth as possible. If you have high liquid level, a little bit of foam cap, and you're traveling on the path and you have a hard stop somewhere, that liquid is going to slosh back and forth. And what that sloshing is doing is just gulping oxygen back into the package. So any filler that has little stopping points throughout this section, little knives or anything like that, it's definitely something that you want to avoid because anything that's going to abruptly stop the can is going to create that washing feature and gulp a bunch more cans. And these features are available on Cody machines and can be retrofitted on existing equipment as well. Great. Um, so you talked about you talked a lot about foaming, and that's obviously you know that's that that's part and parcel with gear production. What about um, where you have non-foaming products? Where you have you know, let's say a still beverage, uh, and it's 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 a common direction that a lot of breweries are going. They're trying to diversify their portfolios. They're trying to improve their um, you know their, their appeal to a broader audience. What do we do with with under foaming situations? That's a great question. So most beers are going to foam up naturally, and there, but there are certain products, specifically seltzers, wines, other things, less proteins. They're not going to foam up as much, or if they foam up, they're going to dissipate. One of the first things to do is a lot of these features are kind of tricks to help aid in the process. But one of the best foundational things you need to understand is that your foam or your breakout is directly proportional to the temperature of your product in your tank. So the best way to create more foam is to actually warm up the tank slightly. Now, luckily with counter pressure machines, we can accept a much higher range of temperature compared to open atmosphere fillers that need a much lower temperature. So raising the temperature of the tank could naturally create some breakout. But one of the things that with the aggressive growth of seltzers is people are realizing that some seltzers, if you aggressively pour them into a pint glass, you'll watch the foam come up and then it'll dissipate within one to two seconds. 
the travel time from here to there is a little bit more than that. And you don't want to present that package at the SEMA location with the phone completely dropped out. So what we're doing is adding jetters and it is a hot water jetter. You can use deaerated water. We've seen people use uh, just RO water and cleaning it and make sure it's at warmer temperature. It's a very, very small amount of water so that it doesn't have negative effects on the flavor profile of the product. But if you do a pinpoint injection of the hot water, it's going to violently break out that foam once again. It's conveniently placed right before the lid dropper is. And we've seen from our testing that some of our clients have moved their shelf stability from three months to a year by just adding this one location, by creating foam, pushing out that residual oxygen, and getting it a good seam. Awesome. So we're almost out of time, and I want to get in a couple of quick questions because they're important. How do you measure DO? Yeah. So one of the things that you need to know is that DO can get measured at a variety of different points. So you want to understand what is happening with your filler. You first have to start with the baseline, and that is testing what is the dissolved oxygen of the product as it's entering into the filler. There are a number of inline monitors that can give you real-time feedback, and the prices are just dropping every year, which is really convenient. If you have that number, and then on the back end, when the cans exit, you get a piercing device that hooks up to a monitor, and that can give you your TPO reading. And the difference between your inline reading of what's coming in and the TPO reading as the cans exit is your pickup on the filler. And then we can also add a number of small ports throughout the filler. So you can test each individual fill head. You can test it before and after every gasket. So you could really get down to the nooks and crannies of what each pickup location can be doing. Okay, so that comes to the final question, which is what would be considered a good bench, you know, benchmark? What's a good DO number that someone should be you know, thinking about or that would maybe use as a target. Yeah, it, it, it's really hard to answer that. Uh, uh, for those of you who've been going to craft brewers conferences for many years, and you go to these talks, the numbers just keep getting lower and lower. Um, most people that are really hypersensitive on dissolved oxygen are gonna get about 10 to 30 parts per billion in their tank. What, one of the interesting thing about dissolved oxygen is that it continually is going to pick up. So you never can lose dissolved oxygen. The more you give us in the tank, the more we're going to pick up in the filler. If you can get less than two, three PPB through the transfer all the way to your fill heads, pick up less than 10, 20 through your filler, and you get a TPO reading of 40, 50 at the exit, for most products, I think that's shelf stable enough for six months, a year, um, international shipping, and Pretty much ready to go at that point. Okay. So as a wrap up, if I'm a brewery owner, if I'm a production manager, quality manager, packaging manager, what's the first step I should take to get my arms around DO to manage it and to, to get it as, as low as possible? Because again, I'm, I'm really concerned about quality. I want my products to last in distribution. I want them to be at their fresh, freshest expression the way I intended it when the customer opens that, that I mean, knowledge is power and getting the experience, understanding how to measure, when to measure, knowing that you're measuring the correct way. It's one of the things is the measurement devices are somewhat challenging to use. So standard operating procedures, so you're measuring it the same way every time, training all of your employees about the importance of dissolved oxygen so that that quality focus is at the forefront of your entire organization and constantly testing, constantly tracking and tweaking and also rely on your supplier. If you can't get the hint, we nerd out about this stuff all the time. I talk about this all day, every day. I love talking about it. Give us a call, help us out. We wanna learn from you. We wanna test new equipment. So get your suppliers involved as well. Awesome. All right, well, thank you. Um, and I think this kind of concludes our, our discussion. I think we move now to the Q&A session. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to the Brewers Journal and uh, we'll wait for our prompt. 